It's Winter's Day in Indianapolis, and it's an exciting day for me because I have two of my old friends here. Aww. They've yeah. been to Indianapolis before. I've got Drew Aldorfer and Lau Nogard. Did I say that correctly? <laughs> yes. They're both from Denmark. However, Drew is... I'm the expat. Expat. Right. And we're going to be talking about something really exciting. Photography's taken some big steps. It's taken some big steps in many areas over the last few months with different mirrorless cameras and other things being announced by different manufacturers. But phase one, being phase one, has taken it to a whole new level. And, and today we're going to be specifically cool. talking about the IQ 4, 100, and 51 megapixel camera. I mean, this is, okay, phenomenal. When I started my career with phase one, and many of you know I was started there, like back at the end of 1999, we were cutting a six megapixel. Oh boy. Wow. Digital back, biggest pixels in the world too, yep. for the size of the sensor, and we were tethered. It was really pretty cool, and we were doing some amazing stuff, image quality, as today was beyond reproach. And it's pretty phenomenal to think, and I would never have thought that back then, we would be here in 2018 looking at 151 megapixel capture devices. And, you know, technology that is just phenomenal. So before we get too far into this, and we're going to talk a lot about the cameras and the technology, uh, Drew and I took some of these cameras out yesterday because I'm one of those kind of guys that has to see it to believe it kind of thing. That's true, you are. And we took... Uh, with the uh, IQ on, on a phase one camera? Yeah, we had the IQ4150 on the XF. I mostly use that. Uh, and then you ran I, around with your, your I Alpha. I ran my Alpha camera with uh, the, 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 the IQ4150 IQ as well. on the back. Yep. Uh, and I shot uh, with a 50 millimeter lens and the 23 millimeter lens. So right. uh, this image we're looking at here was done with the uh, 50, I believe. Mm -hmm. This truly defines what I call immersive imaging. Yeah. And what I mean by immersive imaging is, you know, you start somewhere and you go, oh, wow, oh, wow, oh, wow, I can see right in a window. Or look at that, I can see, you know, the hubcap over here, and I can see the words over here, and I can see this over here. So you start looking at the image, and the image, and a piece of the image grabs you, and you kind of go down further and further into the image. Now, this is roughly 100% image. This is a 44-inch wide piece of paper. And as we look at it, you know, we did a roughly forget what we did roughly, rough quarter of a second to half second exposure on here to get some nice water flow and so forth. And we also use some of the tools in Capture One, which we'll be covering in another video. In Capture One 12. Capture One 12, That's what yes. made it fun. Yes, and part of the fun was uh, there's a new uh, layer tool which uh, is based upon luminosity. And that is something to really experience and will change a lot of people in regards mm -hmm. to the way they make their prints. It's already changed you. Yeah, um, I love it. It's, it's down, down before coffee and but I think on my images. So that print is, like you said, roughly 100%. So this is basically the equivalent of like a contact print. Yeah. You know, I mean, this is 151 megapixels of resolution. Your immersive imaging description, your viewing distance on this is really the, the bridge of your nose. I mean, that's uh, how, how detailed everything is. And the better your printer, the more detail you're going to be able to see. The one below it, you shot this with your Alpa. You shot uh, this with the Alpa and the 23 millimeter lens. And it's important to note that while we were in there, we were um, impatient. It was a long day. Yes. It was uh, beautiful weather. And we did not shoot a uh, LCC plate. No, and we shot this picture sitting down on a bench. Yeah. <laughs> 23 millimeter and no LCC. Yeah. So, and we're going to talk about that because how Lau has worked with his team to minimize the need of the LCC is pretty incredible. We are, there's still fall off in things that are natural with a wide angle lens like that with a short flange distance. I guess you'd call that the flange distance. Yeah. But uh, we'll talk about that as, as we move forward here. But uh, we visited this place in Indiana called Bridgeton and there was a covered bridge and there's a mill. And inside the mill there's this character, wears a top hat and he really grinds flowers, pancake mm. mixes and all sorts of things. And, I have visited him several times before, 
And uh, he remembered me, and one of the last times I tested a camera there was a 50 megapixel camera. And he goes, all right, did you have that 50 megapixel camera with you? I said, nope, but I have a 151 <laughs> megapixel camera with me. And for, for that, he always like, what can I do? You know, he was right. ready to pose and do all sorts of things. So we set the tripod up, Drew and I sat on a bench and uh, part of me working with the camera yesterday was learning about uh, the new user interface. And the camera has a brand new user interface. Yeah, we completely, totally overhauled that yeah. as, a, as part of making the new one. And it's actually like, wow, so totally different than anyone would experience in a user interface such as you see on a DSLR camera that we're gonna do a whole segment just on that. But for me, it was kind of getting to learn how to use all that, work with the uh, live view and understand how live view works, which really has changed dramatically. And I, I didn't give you any tutorial on it. It no. was a uh, trial by fire. So <laughs> I just gave you the system, turned it on and said, figure it out. And I just watched Kevin use it and uh, you know, fully anticipating that Kevin would fumble over things, but uh, I very fumbled quickly, a little bit. You picked it up. Yeah, so, there's one or two things I needed a little help on, which was like, uh, you, you can inherit, is that the right word, a black cow? So if you're shooting something over and over again, you don't have to do that black cow over right, and over with again. With a technical camera, you don't have to do it with every single frame. You can right. choose to if you want, yep, but, or you can just do one image with a black reference, it'll carry it over to the next. That kind of is how we had it set up in the IQ3, but we've refined that process with the IQ4. So, We've also put in some uh, some calibrations of black reference data. So if you're shooting at uh, shorter shutter speeds, you don't even need to do a black reference. So there's yeah, no kind of delay. We essentially do that uh, in the manufacturing of each individual unit. We do a set of, uh, of dark frames through the ISO range, through uh, shutter speed ranges, and make a mathematical model of that that is then embedded in each individual bag. So for reasonably short shutter speeds, you don't have to do a black reference at all. Wow. You know, before we go too much further, too, I better <laughs> let you know what the titles of each of the gentlemen uh, standing with me are. I'm sorry I didn't do that at the very beginning. Unbelievable. But I uh, just sometimes I'm, I'm so excited about what I'm going to be seeing. You play, don't but, say. Yeah, you excited? We've never seen that before. <laughs> but uh, Lau has this great title, and it's uh, your visionary... Chief visionary Chief officer. Chief visionary officer. CVO, I guess you could CVO. Yeah. Now, what a great title. Um, Many of the cameras for phase one over the last new number of years have been, you know, basically a lot of engineering. And of course, he's had to watch over his engineers. Mm -hmm. Now, what Lau gets to do, and correct me if I'm wrong, but you, you get to spend your time working on the future, working on the present and developing. Yeah, so less time on, uh, on uh, managing people and getting things done, more time on figuring out what to do and why to do it. And how to do it. And how to do it, yes. And that could be dangerous for phase one, because you know, he was sort of you know, reeled in once in a while, and now he's free as a stallion out there <laughs> going for it. And he's got some good ideas, and hopefully we're gonna get some hints to some of those. Uh, I will warn everybody, um, poker face reading is a kind of a must when we talk to phase one. <laughs> Because when I ask questions, I say, yeah, we're not good at it though. No, you're no. You know, we're too excited. Yeah, it's, it used to be fun to kind of like. Uh, it's difficult to talk about the future without talking about the future. I know, <laughs> but it's also like, well, I can't really say. Yeah. Would you like it? <laughs> yes. How should we do that? And Drew, you are a product manager. Yes, one of a, a very strong team of product managers at Phase One. So my area of expertise is the uh, the camera systems. So we've got software product managers, we've got specialty application like our Indu and cultural heritage product managers. But I focus on the IQ4 and the XF and the lenses and that workflow and ecosystem in Capture One. Terrific, and you know, that is really getting to be a really big ecosystem now because everything is yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's so really, it's, it's growing, it's expanding and you know, there's, there's a lot of uh, synergy, pardon the, uh, the marketing term, but there is a lot of synergy between what we do with our industrial guys, our cultural heritage guys, just the guys that are focused on software alone. Uh, so it makes you know, our product management team really fun and uh, really exciting because of all the different things that we're working on and how we get to kind of bounce ideas off of one another. And, and Lau has, has the pleasure of working with, uh, with all of us. Yep. And uh, you know, we, we kind of all sit together and, and plan for the future and how we can uh, put these things in, in motion. Uh, and, and Lau knows how those things will work in, a, in an engineering implementation way, and uh, we kind of know how they're going to work in a commercial, you know, speaking from the photographer's point of view. And you should know something about phase one, and of course, this not only comes from, you know, my experience there, but 
you know, the last five or so years of uh, working with these guys. Phase One is not a large company. It's not a Nikon or a Canon. It's, you know, how many employees roughly worldwide? A few hundred? Well, more than uh, 300, certainly. Oh. Um, and that's, uh, you know, that's across uh, Japan and Israel and the U.S. and the U.K. I mean, we've got uh, lots of offices in, in Asia um, and lots of different uh, engineering teams working on different things. But, you know, part of the beauty of being a, a big company but also a, a small company is that uh, we're very flexible. And we know everybody in the company, so we can call on, get some favors going, uh, you know, really put our brains together and come up with some creative solutions to everything. But I think the creative solution part is something that uh, I think phase one and specifically your team has always taken to the extreme. You know, imagine sitting at a meeting and you write out a spec, you know, we want the camera to perform this, this, or this. Yeah. Or you're given an, uh, a chip, and I, I go back to the P45 days when Kodak uh, made chips and said, you know, this chip, you can't do more than, you know, a 30 second exposure mm. on it or right. something like that. And, you know, the engineers figured out, well, you know, yeah, we, one thing we're good at is putting 50 pounds into a one ounce envelope and, <laughs> right? you know, yes. making it work. So, you know, nothing is status quo. If they get somewhere, it's a challenge to see if it can go yeah. to the next level. And I think that's what makes phase one fun, specifically for anybody who's ever used a phase one camera or played with a phase one camera or worked with Capture One. They're not satisfied. I mean, it's always, once you think you got to the pinnacle of image quality, you find out that it can go even further. Yeah, we, we don't see our cameras as static. We make them, yep. but we make them so we can keep on expanding them. And uh, we try to have this culture within the development team that, that we question everything all the time. Can we make this better? Can we change this? Couldn't we do this in a, in a more intuitive way? Couldn't we squeeze a bit more image quality out of this feature over here? And if we can do that, and we can, if we can get it into the cameras we already made, and I think we will continue to do that. The biggest part of that is, you know, phase one, the team that we have, where no one's afraid to ask why. Yeah. Uh, and it doesn't matter where you are in the company. You know, you, you just ask. When it comes to 151 megapixels of resolution, you know, that can certainly be a spec that I filled out that I said I want a, a system that does this. But someone will ask why. Why does a photographer need that? Why does the industry need that? And that kind of opens up this whole yeah. other discussion of, well, how are we going to use that? How are we going to expand that? How are we going to implement that in the software and implement mm -hmm. that in all these different workflows? And that really just opens up this never ending, you know, questioning ourselves, challenging ourselves, uh, exploration of everything that we're building. That's why we try to involve not just Drew and me in that, but a large part of the team in that so that the actual understanding of these questions and the answers, they are kind of embedded in the team so that all the little decisions that get made in the day-to-day -day work, that they also kind of align with the why. Mm -hmm. and we and try it, to, inst in, to, uh, to spread uh, a joy of photography within the team. Well, I think that's the, the one thing you bring to photography as a photographer. And I say it over and over again. We spend so much time you know, looking at all the tech specs. And yes, we're going to spend some time yep. looking at tech specs here. But in the end, it's about the fun of photography. Yesterday, it was fun. You know, we got a chance to go out with this great camera yeah, system, we had some good weather. find, you know, some interesting, challenging weather. Yep. You know, it's the middle of winter in, in Indiana. It's like, <laughs> luckily we had one of those sort of nice days yeah, that yeah. turned crappy pretty quick. <laughs> Early spring days yeah, somehow. But, uh, you know, before the end it was blowing and cloudy and it, it gave us our challenges. But my God, it was fun. Mm. And, you know, going in and saying this guy and say, hey, can we set up in here using complete available light? in a very challenging area of lots of dark pockets and mm -hmm. you know bright spots along the way and you know getting him the pose and we shot this at what ISO 400 I believe it was yeah, this one's ISO 400 uh, we focused with live view and the the focus peaking yeah mm -hmm. and so I mean really just moving the tripod in and setting it up was the, the hardest part <laughs> right and we, and we just sat down on a bench because it was conveniently located <laughs> and, was. and shot the shot but I remember we live viewed on the his buckles here and, right. and his glasses and when you really explore them, and um, you know, we'll try to show you a little B-roll of, and possibly mm -hmm. uh, in the article, I can uh, share a hundred percent view of this, where you can you know click on it and see mm -hmm. it hundred percent and explore it yourself. Uh, it, it's really remarkable. I mean, you can come in here, and there's bags of flour. You can read on it. And yeah. what what gets me here, and maybe Lau can help me. 
When we have 151 megapixels worth of resolution, and we're working on retina screens or 5K screens, how do you really judge if it's sharp? Because in reality, my screen, I can't see what I can see on the print on the screen. Yeah, I mean, you could zoom in, mm. but then, you know, where's your reference for the scale yeah. of the image? And then, of course, you can look at a, a retina screen and you can try and judge sharpening. Uh, but then when you get to the print, it'll be over sharpened because you're kind of, you know, splitting all these pixels. And if you zoom into 100% on the screen, you will see the pixels, but you you lose that reference or sense of scale of how large that image is. Yep. Mm -hmm. when you, I, I, unfortunately, I wasn't there yesterday. I couldn't be here. But but seeing this print now, I was not in this shop, but uh, I can I can almost smell it. <laughs> yeah. It really is immersive. It's, it's, it's amazing how, how much of the kind of the character of that, that place really is in this print. Is so it? th this is, I think, where the difference lies, you know, for landscape photographers and others. You know, I hear time and time again on different YouTube channels and, and other websites that who needs anything more than 24 megapixels? And of course, you and I were saying, who needs more, you know, 151 megapixels? Right. Mm -hmm. But it is about the resolution. It is about the detail. And it's about the ability to make a print this way and read the, the recipe and the instructions on a bag. Yeah, and I think, you know, that's for just us, a small part of the picture. For us, it's about the image quality. Mm -hmm. And if to get better image quality, uh, we can have higher resolution, then of course we'll take it. And the end result, you know, it's, it's only going to be as good as what you start with. And so regardless of if you're making a print, this is a 165% uh, scale. Regardless of whether or not you're making a print this big, if you start with you know, the best high quality pixels and a lot of them, your end result, no matter what size you output, is going to be better. It's you have, you have be... that editing headroom, you know, yeah. the resolution headroom, so that if you have to do anything, any editing, you are, you are never getting close to that edge of, uh, of kind of running out of resolution. As an example, uh, an 8K screen, which we probably will have all of us very soon. Cool. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's is right. buying? Mark your word. Uh, eight, eight, 8K monitors, they are more than 30 megapixels. So, as you said before, who needs more than 24? If you have to view it on an 8K screen, you need more than 24. Yeah. So, and if you have to make output that somebody has to view on an 8K screen, you have to start out with quite a bit more to have that editing headroom. There's so much about the, the editing, though. I mean, in this picture, and, and this is a good example of, of dynamic range, too. Sure. Which, which I think yeah. also comes with uh, the phase one back. So yeah. there, you're, you're working with 16-bit. 16 16-bit um, 16 uh, color. And we've got uh, this particular shot. You shot it in the IQ Large Extended, which is 15 stops of dynamic range. You know, 15 stop, real true 15 stops dynamic range. Now, there's been plenty of articles in the past in regards to what uh, bit depth means. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's a huge uh, consideration, specifically when you're trying to show uh, dimension. Sure. Um, like if you had a bowling ball and, you know, the light kind of goes from black to white or specular to black on that bowling ball. The 16-bit uh, ability to have the nuances yeah. in all each of those pixels and the, to mm -hmm. and the tonality is where you'd see the difference between the 12 Just having and having that, co that the color of a bowling okay. ball or an apple or something like that from the deep shadow and all the way into the, to the specular highlight and, and seeing yeah. the, that the color is real all the way through that. I think that, that is uh, one of the places where that really makes a difference. So it, it might be hard to see it but I know like in this particular shot where we have a lot of highlights right up in here mm -hmm. and you know some of the other areas on the specular side of things, those things, all these little pieces are like all the fine ingredients that make the picture overall yeah, yeah. that much better. And uh, you know having the dynamic range is great because you know then you can go in and control it. For example, I use Capture One and just brushed a layer in here on the floor. The floor was rather bright since the light was coming down on it. Right. So I just tried to tone it down a little bit so that it wasn't kind of glaring and at least we could kind of go into the subject here. Mm. But you can really do some exploration and we can see detail out the window, right? You know, which is kind of cool too. So we're in this dark room with, you know, fluorescent lights and little spotlights, but you know, we can see in and out and underneath and 
everywhere. It just, yeah, and I think, yeah. I mean, this is a great example of uh, all that dynamic range. Like you said, you know, this one light that's above the character here with this top hat, you know, this is, there's so many tones of that highlight in there. I mean, this is nice and smooth and clean, but then you go into all these nooks and crannies of, of shadow detail and everything's in there. Yeah. Now, all of that dynamic range that's in that file gives you all this editing headroom, like yeah. Lau said. So when we all shot film uh, and, and maybe even chromes, you know, we had seven stops of dynamic range. <clears throat> you had no kind of flexibility in uh, pushing or pulling the, the file. What you shot is what your print should reflect. That's why it was so important that you knew exactly what you were doing right. in the moment. With digital photography and all this dynamic range, we know that we're going to edit this in, uh, in software. We know that there's going to be this huge contribution to making really, uh, you know, some, some artistic choices like burning down the, the floor and kind of bringing up some detail or, you know, removing something. If we start with data that uh, is limited in any way, be it resolution or color bit depth or dynamic range, it limits what we can do in the editing process. And that ultimately is going to limit the quality that we're going to end up with. And again, the quality we end up with here is a print, but it could be online. It could be, you know, a very small print. It could be for a magazine. But again, starting with as much data and yeah. the best data that you can. And both dynamic range, color-wise and resolution-wise, if you have that surplus of quality, essentially, it stands up to editing. Yeah. So and that, 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 of course, talks about today, right? Yeah. Today, you know, on this fine winter's day in 2019, when we, we have all of this information, that's one thing. But when Lau and I put our heads together about this IQ4 and where we want to bring it. You know, we've over-engineered this thing so it's got way more power than we need because we know this camera is not a 12-month, 18-month camera. Mm. This is a five-year-plus camera system. Yeah. And so all of that, you know, we can't introduce a new sensor into the camera that you already own. We, it's just, that's not practical. But we can introduce new firmware and new ways of reading the sensor, new ways of using the sensor. So if we start with this huge surplus where maybe nobody needs 151 megapixels today, but five years, six years, 10 years from now, that might just be kind of commonplace. Yeah, and, and when, uh, when we went from 100 to 150 megapixels, we, we didn't just add a new sensor in there, we completely re-engineered, redesigned from scratch, everything inside the back. There's nothing shared. It's a completely new architecture. And in that process of making that, well, the, the very simple thing would be that it's 50% 50, 50 more pixels, from 100 to 150. So we should make sure that we add more processing power, maybe 50% more, so we can keep up, so we, it doesn't become slow. But that's maybe even double, so we, we can be a bit faster. <laughs> but that's not how we think, because no. that would enable us to do the same things with more pixels. We didn't want to do the same things. So an IQ4 is about, give and take, 10 times more powerful than IQ3. No kidding. On almost all parameters. Because that enables us not just to do the same things a bit faster, but to do new kinds of things. It's an order of magnitude. It's a, it's a, it's a significant leap. And some of that power, processing power, we use now for some of the features in the, in the new IQ4. But most of it, essentially, we, we have that as, as headroom to do new things in the future. Because as, as Drew said, we put in the new center. That's an absolutely fantastic sensor. It will be absolutely fantastic for a long while. And we want the rest of the system to be up to, to that, not just for now, but for the foreseeable the year, the years ahead, right. essentially. Wow. So we can keep on adding and inventing new things just in software updates and firmware updates. So let, let's, let's do a, a, a cut here for a second. Okay. Let's clear off the print and let's bring out the cameras and let's have a serious talk about Exactly that. Yeah. Where we were, where we are, and how we may be going in the future. Sure. So mm -hmm. we'll be right back with another segment, and uh, this time we'll get a little deeper into the camera side of things. Um, I have to say, though, and Drew, thank you for you know coming in early and going out with me yesterday. Shooting oh, my pictures. pleasure. Thanks for having good weather. <laughs> it was just <laughs> once again. It's always there, there's just something about no matter what, getting out there and taking the shot. And right. then being able to come in here and in half an hour, uh, you know, work a print and uh, get it printed out so that we can actually look at it like this and try to really appreciate what these cameras are doing. So thank you very much. And uh, let's come right back yep. and get into the hardware itself and a little bit more on that side of things. Sounds good. Okay. Yep.